Welcome back guys, another response video for you here. In this one, we're gonna talk about anger and why psychologists keep getting it wrong. To offer us a lens into this issue, we have a TEDx talk from Olympia, Washington. So not only can we criticize the popular misunderstanding of anger, but we can make fun of TEDx and the kind of speakers they tend to attract. Let's see what this one, one Russell Colts, has to say. So I'm a psychologist. <laughs> and a lot of my work involves using compassion-focused therapy to help people work with emotions like anger. Anger can be a tricky emotion to work with because it can feel really powerful in us. So even when we can see that our uncontrolled anger is causing lots of problems in our lives or in our relationships, we can be reluctant to give it up. See what he did there? Already a problem. He conflated anger, he conflated feeling angry with uncontrolled anger. Already demonizing an extremely productive mental state, anger. Anger is a stimulant. It is dopamine in our brain. It literally does to our brain what a stimulant does. It is a beautiful experience to conflate that experience of being angry with uncontrolled anger. That's a different thing. That's called hostility. I'll link to my video on anger and hostility and compassion below, how this really works. So the point is, of course, that feeling anger is healthy. Using anger in an unproductive, uncontrolled way, hostility, it is unhealthy. But they're two different things. And what this guy's going to do and what psychology does in general is conflate those two things. Extremely damaging, especially to young men, because we hear, oh, anger is such a terrible thing. Or using anger in an unproductive way is such a terrible thing. Not distinguishing that from just feeling our anger. And we begin to think that simply feeling our anger is somehow negative and we begin to turn away from it. Now, this Russell Colts guy is going to tell us not to turn away from our anger, but the implication of his viewpoint because he can fail, because he, he fails, excuse me, to distinguish between anger and hostility. The implication of this whole thing is going to be to turn away from your anger. Continuing. We like feeling powerful. You know, we like feeling strong. Yes. Anger is powerful, and it's good to feel powerful. It's what we do with that power that matters. Have we not watched Spider-Man? Continuing. Now, my own journey toward using compassion to work with anger actually began when my son was born, and I got to see the impact my own anger was having on my family. You see, I've got what you might call an angry or an irritable temperament. One way to think of temperament is the idea that some people are born having an easier time experiencing certain emotions. So some of you, I suspect, are very easygoing. Right? You tend to take things in stride. and Don't get too worked up when things don't go your way. And if you're like that, by the way, good for you. Right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's nice. It's a nice way to be. However, others of us will have a very different experience of life. Some of you, for example, may have a much more anxious temperament. And you may notice feelings of anxiety coming up in you easily, frequently, and sometimes very powerfully. If you're like this, by the way, don't beat yourself up for it. It's not your fault. Okay, now this seems like a really nice thing that he's doing. This seems like he's saying, hey, if you have an anxious temperament, it's okay. He's not saying it's okay. He's saying it's not your fault. The implication is having an anxious temperament, feeling strong emotions is somehow detrimental to you. There's something wrong with emotions. Now we can talk all day about, oh, we need to feel our feelings and we need to confront our emotions and understand, or they don't say, they don't say understand what's there. Oh, and we need to get in touch with them. But the implication is having strong, what he's talking about here is an erotic temperament. Having an erotic temperament is somehow detrimental. No, having an erotic temperament is a great thing because it allows you to feel emotions better and stronger. So it allows you to engage with reality in a healthier way. This is the key of, of healthy, mature emotional management is the engagement of reality. Our emotions are a reflection. They are a barometric reading of reality. 
Now, having a calm temperament is fine too, but it doesn't make you better in any sense. We equate mental health now with just being calm and stoic and imperturbable. Phlegmatic, a lot of big words here, but it's not that. It's how do we engage with reality? It's not how it looks. It's not how we look. That's not mental health, but it's how we engage. Continuing. No, I mean it. It's not your fault. You see, we don't get to choose our temperament. But if we're going to have happy lives and good relationships, we've got to take responsibility for working with what we've got. And part of what I had to work with is anger and irritability. Now, this really came to a head for me when my son was about about three months old. And I was home taking care of him one day. And it was a day in which I had a lot of work that I really wanted to get done. And so the parents among you will not be surprised to find out that on this particular day, my son took about an hour and a half longer than normal to go to sleep for his morning nap. And I remember, like, finally he goes to sleep. And I'm gently setting him down in the crib and tiptoeing out of the room. And just as I get in the other room and I sit down to work, the cry Just as an aside here, he mentioned his son was three months old. You're never supposed to leave a three-month-old alone, ever. Not even for a nap. If you're working and your three-month-old son is there taking a nap, you leave your three-month-old in the room. Not until about six months. After six months, then they can get their own room. They can nap by themselves. But, I mean, look, technically, a three-month-old is supposed to be in the mother's womb still. The only reason the mother births it... Because if she birthed it when it was really ready to be birthed, the the head would be too big, the head of the baby would be too big, and it would explode out her pelvis. Yeah, your son is supposed to cry when you leave him alone when he's three months old. And everybody knows this. Psychologists all know this to be true. But they don't talk about it, of course, for certain political reasons. Continuing. And with that cry, I was filled with anger. It took everything in me not to rush across the hall, stand over his crib, and yell, why can't you just sleep? Luckily, that didn't happen. But something else did. The intensity of the anger I felt at my infant son for doing nothing more than like, you know, not sleeping at the exact moment I wanted him to sleep, it it shocked me awake. And I knew that if I was going to be anything like the sort of father I wanted my son to have, that I had to do something about my anger. Now, if you get angry at the fact that your three-month-old son is crying, that's not the reason that you're angry. But if you turn away from your anger, or at most feel your anger, and let yourself be okay with the feeling of the anger, if that's all you do, you will never look at what is the root of your anger. There's something else going on. Our emotions are a lens. They're a tool to, of course, engage reality, like I said, but also to engage with ourselves, to understand what's going on with ourselves. There is some sort of need that is going unmet in your life, but you're too afraid to look at it for whatever reason, and getting angry at your son triggers that anger, but it's not the reason you're angry. But Russell Colts doesn't understand this because the most that he gets to The most we get out of this psychologist, which, hey, is better than most psychologists, I would say, is to at least feel your anger. Be okay with feeling your anger. Great, but what's behind the anger? What do we really need? Do we need our son to stop crying? Not really. That's not what we really need. Continuing. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever said or done something out of anger that's caused terrible pain in the people you love the most? Correction, hostility, not anger. Can we please demarcate between these two very different emotional states? Continuing. Do you find yourself wanting to move toward that experience or to move away from it and avoid it? It can also be a pretty lonely thing to be someone who struggles with anger. I mean, think about it. When we see someone who's anxious, what do we want to do? We want to approach and reassure them. 
When we see someone who's sad, we want to approach and comfort them. What do you want to do when you see someone who's angry and hostile? You want to get the heck out of there, right? (laughs) Of course you do. We all do. That's part of what anger does. All right, can we start making fun of this guy now? These are the most hostile people in the world. The people who present in this hippie sort of way. I mean, maybe it's just the fact that he's from Olympia, Washington. Within a 500-mile radius of Seattle, he has no choice. It is very difficult to not be an, an aging hippie liberal douche, to quote South Park when you're, when you're from Seattle. But these are the most hostile people. This is the affect of the whole hippie thing. And they'll, hey, cool, man. I mean, how how much work did it get him to take off his sandals to actually wear brown shoes for this? This is why we have hippies. It's because they feel the hostility in themselves. They don't know how to manage it. They It makes them feel wrong for having it. And so they do their best to turn away from it. They get a freaking goatee. They grow this hair. They untuck their shirt. They probably wear sandals. And they have this breathy sort of, ah, can we have to, do you hear the breathiness in this voice? Are you sure that son's yours? Do you even have the testosterone to get some sort of erection? And they can't even give it a, a speech without an erection, without any sort of potence behind it. And I hear it over and over again. Guys try to go to therapy. They even get a male therapist and they end up getting a male therapist like this. And they just get weirded out. Why does your voice need to be breathy? Because you sense something in yourself that you don't like. So everything you do is an apology. And you're trying to tell us to come to terms with our anger, but the implication is there's something wrong with anger. We'll get to it. You're going to feel your anger, but ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to do something to cover the anger up. You're not going to manage the anger. You're not going to engage with it. You're going to cover it up because ultimately you see it as something that is wrong within you. So everything else in your life is going to be one huge apology. Like your voice tone. Continuing. Pushes people away. But what that means is that if you are someone who really struggles with anger, you can get very used to the sight of other people walking away because they don't want to be around you. And that's hard. For me, although the feeling of my anger felt powerful in me, when I really took a look at it, I discovered that behind that anger were a lot of other much more vulnerable feeling emotions. The fear that I couldn't control my own feelings. The sadness that my behavior was so different from the man I wanted to be. And the shame of watching the people I love the most walking on eggshells around me, afraid that they would say or do some random thing that would set me off. And here we go. He's trying to look behind his anger. Good. I appreciate the intention there. But he totally fails. Instead of looking at what is the cause of his anger, do you notice what he's doing here? He's listing out the effect of his anger. He's afraid of his anger. He feels shame because of his anger. He doesn't like the fact that people leave him alone or that people try to avoid him because of his anger. I mean, you have to try to reverse cause and effect. (laughs) To think that the fear is the cause of your anger, even though you'd say right after, I feel afraid because of the anger. (laughs) What? Continuing. And in the face of all that scary stuff, I did what a lot of folks do. I avoided. <laughs> right? I just tried not to feel it. Distract yourself, blame other people, rationalize, those sorts of things, right? And over time, I discovered through experience what a growing body of scientific research is demonstrating, which is that working with difficult emotions by avoiding them doesn't work. And often... <laughs> and often makes things worse. Good. I totally agree. 
Don't avoid emotions. Feel the emotion, confront the emotion, live in the emotion. But this guy's going to end here. He's not going to get any further than this. Why? Because he doesn't even understand what emotions are. He looks at the research and he goes, oh, look, it, it, it works out better when you feel the emotions. Not that it works out better, but it definitely works out way worse when you avoid the emotion. Of course. But psychology doesn't go any further than this because they don't have a structure for how your emotions work. So what he's going to end up doing here is he's going to feel his anger, which sure, it's better than turning away from it, but if you don't do anything with the anger, you're going to end up covering it up. And of course, he doesn't say cover up your anger, but effectively, that's what his prescription is. Continuing. Now, being a good father was important to me, though. So at this point, I took decisive action in the way we academics do, I began to read. <laughs> and one of the books I read was about His Holiness the Dalai Lama of Tibet. Uh-oh. Turning to religion for the answers. The point of psychology was to elucidate religion. It was to concretize the symbols that religion talks about. That is effectively the point of psychology. It's not to turn back to religion. Basically, what you're saying here is, I, I'm not smart enough to do the job of a psychologist, so I'm just going to listen to what the Dalai Lama says. Continuing. And in that book, I saw a vision of the sort of man I wanted to be, the sort of father I hoped I could become. Now, don't get me wrong. I have no aspirations to be the leader of a worldwide religion. But it was that courage that wisdom, the kindness, the compassion. You see, compassion involves allowing ourselves to be moved by suffering, the suffering of other people, and even our own suffering. What is he doing here? He seems to be equating compassion with pity. If you see other people suffering and feel like you need to do something to alleviate their suffering, Either you feel pity for them or for yourself, because essentially what you're saying is, if I was in that position, I wouldn't be able to do anything to get myself out of it. Now, this guy goes into a lot of wishy-washy language here of his transformation, and I think his transformation is legitimate. I think he probably did go through some sort of process of feeling his anger and getting some sort of need met or injustice rectified, but I don't think he's smart enough to really deconstruct what happened. But that's giving him the benefit of the doubt. What may have happened is he read the Dalai Lama, learned that anger is bad, compassion is good. He felt his anger. Okay, he got somewhere, but then he chose compassion. Instead of really getting in touch with what was going on with him, what he needed, what was ultimately the cause of him getting angry when his, when his three-month-old son was crying. He felt this feeling of anger, said, okay, I'm feeling the anger. I'm getting comfortable with the anger. Now I'm going to choose compassion. I'm going to choose to help people. Close, but so far. You get your needs met, and in the getting of your needs met, and whatever injustice is rectified, you naturally take on a feeling of compassion. It feels very similar to gratitude. Compassion and gratitude are not something that you make yourself feel. That is called repression. You are repressing your anger. And you will end up growing your hair out, getting a goatee, and affecting with this breathiness. You don't want to do that. You want to look at the unmet needs causing your anger, get those unmet needs met, and you'll naturally take on a state of compassion, of being a compassionate person which is the fundamental understanding that you live in a universe in which you can get your needs met. Now, it may take some digging, may take some creativity, figuring out what your needs are, really what they are, and how to go about getting those met in a mature way, not only beneficial for you, but beneficial for other people. And this guy has a pretty good view of anger compared to most psychologists. I had a professor tell me that the only reason men feel anger is so they can feel powerful. I mean, she comes from the whole feminist philosophy. 
but how do you think she's going to treat a, a young man who feels anger? Oh, this is a toxic state. We need to distract you from this state as much as possible. She may not even let him feel the anger. At least this guy's in touch with, it is good to feel the anger to some extent, but only to a certain extent. And ultimately, the anger's useless. There's no real upside to having anger, only a downside. That's why at the beginning of the video, he said, hey, if you're neurotic, that's ultimately a bad thing. Of course, he doesn't say that, but that's the implication. Positive psychologists, when they tell you to be happy and, oh, choose happiness, they aren't telling you to repress sadness and, and anxiety. And if you talk to a positive psychologist like this, we'd say, oh, we, we don't say to, to, to deny anything. Yeah, but implicitly, that's what you do. Our emotions are telling us something. They are useful. Whenever you feel an emotion, especially a strong emotion, you say, oh, good. What is this telling me to do? Another opportunity to engage ever more with reality. I know what this means because I read Man's Guide to Psychology.com and I know that our emotions have a certain structure. I know they have a cause. I know they have effect. Even if I can't deal with this right now, even if I, I can't look at the, the real cause of my anger right now, at least I know that a solution exists. Now that is a powerful mindset, but you're not making yourself have a certain mindset. You're not choosing an emotion over others. You are understanding reality. That'll make you feel more powerful, even more powerful perhaps, than anger.